Chapter 16 of The Cat of Bubastes, A Tale of Ancient Egypt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Cat of Bubastes by G. A. Henty. Chapter 16 Up the Nile. Late at night Jethro again went up to the hiding place on the hill. Chigron had just returned from another visit to the city. He said, the whole of the town is in an uproar the news that tylus and his son have been found slain has been received and the excitement is tremendous the death by violence of two high priests of osiris within so short a time is regarded as a presage of some terrible national misfortune that one should have been slain was an almost unprecedented act an insult of a terrible kind to the gods but this second act of sacrilege has almost maddened the people some regard it as a judgment of osiris and deem that it is a proof that as a few ventured to whisper before the death of ameres was brought about by an intrigue among a party of the priests headed by tylus others see in it a fresh proof of the anger of the god against egypt the king himself will it is said take part in services of propitiation in the temple of osiris to-morrow sacrifices are to be offered they say in all the temples a solemn fast will be proclaimed to-morrow and all the people high and low are to shave their eyebrows and to display the usual signs of mourning so far i have heard nothing as to the fact that two girls who were in the house are discovered to be missing but to-morrow when those who were in the house are questioned by the magistrates this fact will doubtless come out and the men will own that by the orders of tylus they carried misa away at the time the attack on the house was made at present however there is no question of women in the case and i can go down to the boat with the girls in company with chigron without any fear whatever but it is better that you should not be with us when we embark for when the matter comes to be talked over some one who sees us embark might notice that our number tallies with that of the three persons present when tylus was killed and the two missing girls therefore chigron's opinion is that it will be safer for you to start at once and walk to mita a village twenty miles up the river there the boat will lie up to-morrow night and as soon as it is dark you can come on board i shall tell the boatmen that i expect you to join us there as you have gone on ahead to transact some business for me in the neighborhood that is certainly the best plan amuba agreed there are too many who know chebron by sight for it to be safe for him to go down to the boat here and embark in broad daylight i will take two hours sleep before i start for as i did not sleep last night and have walked forty miles since i left the chariot i feel in need of a little repose before i start again i was foolish not to have slept this afternoon for i have since midday been hiding near but there was so much to think about that i had no inclination to do so especially as i believed that we would have a night's rest here i will wake you chebron said i have been asleep the better part of the day having had nothing to do since we arrived here yesterday evening chebron sat watching the stars until he saw that they had made two hours journey through the sky then he roused amuba both now laid aside their garments as peasants and put on the attire prepared for them as the sons of a small trader amuba had submitted although with much disgust to have his head shaved on the night following the death of ameres and it was a satisfaction to him to put on a wig for accustomed as he was to see the bare heads of the peasants it was strange and uncomfortable to him to be going about in the same fashion as soon as they were dressed they started made their way down to the bank of the river above the town and walked along the broad causeway by the stream until within a mile or two of their destination then they turned off toward a clump of trees which were visible by the first gleam of dawn a quarter of a mile away here they slept for some hours and late in the afternoon returned to the side of the river and strolled quietly along watching the boats those in the middle of the stream were making their way down with the current lightly and easily, the crews often singing merrily, rejoicing over the approaching meeting with their friends after an absence of many weeks. The boats going up the stream were all close to the bank, the crews walking along the causeway and laboring at the tow-ropes, for there was not enough wind to render the sails of any utility in breasting the stream. The craft were of various kinds, some shapeless and rudely fashioned, used in conveying corn from the country higher up down to Thebes, and now returning empty. Others were the fancifully painted boats of the wealthy, with comfortable cabins and sails of many colors richly decorated and embroidered. These were carrying their owners up or down the river, between their country mansions and the city. 
it was half an hour after sunset when the two friends arrived at maita darkness falls quickly in egypt after the sun has gone down and their features could scarcely have been recognized had they been met by any one acquainted with them in the streets the scene in the streets of the little village was a busy one its distance from thebes rendered it a general halting place for the night of the boats which had left the capital early and a great number of these were already moored off the bank while others were arriving in quick succession the boatmen and passengers were busy making their purchases at the shops fishermen with well-filled baskets were shouting the praises of their fish fowlers with strings of ducks and geese hanging from poles from their shoulders were equally clamorous in offering them for sale the shops of the fruiterers and bakers and those of the vendors of the vegetables that formed so large a portion of the diet of the egyptians were all crowded and the wine shops were doing a brisk business chebron and amuba made their way through the busy scene keeping a sharp lookout for jethro for they considered it certain that owing to the early start the boat was to make it would have arrived there some hours before and that he would be on the lookout for them in a few minutes they saw him looking into one of the shops he started as they went up to him and touched him for he had not perceived them before all well amuba asked everything has gone off admirably we got off without the slightest trouble but come on board at once the girls are anxious about you although i assured them that there was not the slightest risk of your being discovered on your way here so saying jethro led the way to the boat which was moored by the bank a hundred yards above the village in order jethro said that they could make an early start in the morning and be off before the rest of the boats were under way here are your brothers jethro said in a loud voice as he stepped on board i found them dawdling and gossiping in the street forgetting altogether that you were waiting for your evening meal until they came on board both entered the cabin which was about eight feet wide and twelve feet long but not high enough for them to stand upright the floor was spread with a thick carpet cushions and pillows were arranged along each side and thick matting hung from the top in the daytime this was rolled up and fastened so that the air could play through the cabin and those within could look out at the river but at present it closed the openings and kept out both the night air and the glances of passers-by at the other end was a door opening into the smaller cabin allotted to the girls a lamp swung from the beams overhead Misa gave a cry of pleasure as they entered and was about to spring to her feet when jethro exclaimed mind your head child you are not accustomed to these low quarters yet thank the gods we are together again Misa said as chebron after embracing her sat down on the cushion beside her i feel almost happy now in spite of the dreadful times that have passed it does feel homelike here chebron said looking round especially after sleeping in the open air on the hard ground as we have been doing for the last month i should hardly have known you amuba Misa said you do look so different in your wig and with your skin darkened i must look horrible amuba replied rather ruefully you don't look so nice Misa replied frankly i used at first to think that short wavy golden hair of yours was strange and that you would look better in a wig like other people but now i am sorry it is gone here is our meal jethro said as the hangings that served as a door were drawn aside and one of the men entered bearing a dish of fried fish and another of stewed ducks which he placed on the floor Jethro produced some cups and a jar of wine from a locker in the cabin, and then the men, by his orders, brought in a jar of water for the use of the girls. Then, sitting round the dishes, they began their meal, Jethro cutting up the food with his dagger, and all helping themselves with the aid of their fingers and pieces of bread that served them for the purpose of forks. Misa had been accustomed always to the use of a table, but these were only used in the abodes of the rich, and the people in general sat on the ground to their meals. "'We have not begun our hardships yet,' Misa said, smiling. "'I should not mind how long this went on. I call this much better than living in a house, don't you, Ruth?' "'It is more natural to me than that great house of yours,' Ruth replied. "'And, of course, to me it is far more homelike and comfortable. "'For I do not think I was a favorite among the other servants. "'They were jealous of the kindness you showed me.' "'There is one thing I wanted to say,' Jethro said. "'It is better that we should not call each other by our names. "'I am sure that the boatmen have no suspicion here "'that we are other than what we seem to be. "'But they can hardly help hearing our names, "'for all Egypt has rung with them for the last month, "'and it would be well if we changed them for the present.' 
you must of necessity call me father since that is the relation i am supposed to bear to you amuba can become amnis and chebron chefu and i will be mitis mysa said what name will you take ruth there is no egyptian name quite like yours it matters not what you call me ruth said we will call you nite mysa said i had a great friend of that name but she died and there is one thing nite chebron said that i wish you to understand just now you spoke to me as my lord chebron that sort of thing must not be any longer we are all fugitives together and mysa and i have no longer any rank jethro and amuba are of high rank in their own country and if we ever get safely to their own people they will be nobles in the land while we shall be but strangers as he was when he and jethro came into egypt therefore any talk of rank among us is but folly we are fugitives and my life is forfeited if i am discovered in my own land jethro is our leader and guardian alike by the will of our father and because he is older and wiser than any of us amuba is as my elder brother being stronger and braver and more accustomed to danger than i while you and mysa are sisters inasmuch as you are both exiled from your own land and are friendless save for each other and us i am glad to hear you say that brother mysa said i spoke to her last night about it for she would insist on treating me as if she were still my servant which is absurd and not nice of her when she is going out with us to share our dangers only because she loves me it is i rather who should look up to her for i am very helpless and know nothing of work or real life while she can do all sorts of things besides when we were captives it was she who was always brave and hopeful and kept up my spirits when i do think if it had not been for her i should have died of grief and terror by the way jethro said we have not heard yet how it was that you were together we heard of your being carried off but old liptus told me that no one had seen aught of you they were all scared out of their senses ruth said scornfully the men suddenly ran into the room and seized mysa and twisted a shawl round her head before she had time to call out i screamed and one of them struck me a blow which knocked me down then they carried her off i think i was stunned for a moment when i recovered i found they were gone i jumped up and ran along the passage and through the hall where the women were screaming and crying and then out of the house through the garden and out of the gate then i saw four men at a short distance off carrying mysa to a cart standing a hundred yards away i ran up just as they laid her in it one of them turned upon me with a dagger i said let me go with her and i will be quiet if not i will scream and if you kill me it will only set the people on your traces the men hesitated and i ran past them and climbed into the cart and threw myself down by mysa and then they drove off it was brave and good of you ruth jethro said laying his hand on the girl's shoulder but why did you not scream when you first came out of the gate it might have brought aid and prevented mysa from being carried off i thought of that ruth said but there were numbers of rough men still coming in at the gate and knowing how the people had been stirred up to anger against us i did not know what might happen if i gave the alarm besides i was not sure at first that these men although they seemed so rough and violent were not really friends who were taking away mysa to save her from the popular fury yes that might have been the case jethro agreed at any rate child you acted bravely and well we were hoping all along that you were with mysa for we knew what a comfort you would be to her only as the women all declared you did not pass out after her we did not see how that could be and now might descent nite you had better retire to your own cabin to rest for though you have both kept up wonderfully all this has been a great strain for you and you are both looking fagged and heavy-eyed to-night you can sleep in comfort for for the present i think that there is no occasion whatever for the slightest anxiety it was some time before jethro and his companions lay down to sleep they talked long and earnestly of the journey that lay before them and when they had exhausted this topic chebron said till now jethro i have not asked you about my father's funeral when is it to be i have thought of it often but as you did not speak i thought it better not to question you i was glad you did not jethro replied it will be in about ten days time as i believed you guessed chigron is embalming him 
the process will not be completed for another four days and as you know the relatives do not see the corpse after it is in the hands of the embalmer until it is swathed and in the coffin chigron has done so much that must have been against his conscience that i did not like him to be asked to allow you to break through that custom which to him is a sort of religion beside dear lad i thought it better for yourself not to renew your griefs by gazing on a lifeless face during the last month you have fortunately had so much to distract your thoughts that you have not had time to dwell upon your loss moreover you have needed all your strength and your energy for your search for your sister and right sure am i that your father who was as sensible as he was wise and the two things do not always go together would be far better pleased to see you energetic and active in your search for your sister and in preparation for this new life on which we are entering than in vain regrets for him therefore lad for every reason i thought it better to keep silent upon the subject it may be a satisfaction however for you to know that everything will be done to do honor to the dead the king and all the great men of egypt will be present and thebes will turn out its thousands to express its grief for the deed done by a section of its population had it not been for the express commands of your father i should have thought that it might have been worth while for you to present yourself on that occasion and it may be that for once even the fanatics would have been satisfied to have pardoned the offence of the son because of the wrong done to the father however this affair of tylus puts that out of the question for when it is generally known that mysa was carried off when tylus was slain public opinion will arrive at the truth and say that the fugitives of whom they were in search the slayers of the sacred cat were the rescuers of the daughter of ameres and the slayers of the high priest you are right jethro it will be better for me not to have seen my father i can always think of him now as i saw him last which is a thousand times better than if he dwelt in my memory as he lies in the sere clothes in the embalming room of chigron as to what you say about my appearing at the funeral i would in no case have done it i would a thousand times rather live an exile or meet my death at the hands of savages than crave mercy at the hands of the mob of thebes and live to be pointed at all my life as the man who had committed the abhorred offence of killing the sacred cat the conversation in the cabin had all been carried on in an undertone for although through an opening in the curtains they could see the crew who had been eating their meal by the light of a torch of resinous wood and were now wrapped up in thick garments to keep off the night dew chatting merrily together and occasionally breaking into snatches of song it was prudent to speak so that not even a chance word should be overheard the boatmen indeed were in high spirits their home lay far up near the borders of upper egypt and it was seldom indeed that they obtained a job which gave them the chance of visiting their friends thus the engagement was most satisfactory to them for although their leader had haggled over the terms he and they would gladly have accepted half the rate of pay rather than let such an opportunity slip as chebron finished speaking they were preparing for the night by laying down a few mats on the boards of the foredeck then they huddled closely together, pulled another mat or two over them, extinguished the torch, and composed themselves to sleep. "'We will follow their example, but a little more comfortably, I hope,' Jethro said. The cushions and pillows were arranged, the lamp turned low, and in a short time all on board the boat were sound asleep. No ray of light had entered the cabin when Amuba was awakened by a movement of the boat, caused by a stir among the crew he felt his way to the door and threw back the hangings and looked out there was a faint greenish-yellow light in the east but the stars were still shining brightly good morning young master the captain said i hope you have slept well so well that i could hardly believe it was morning amuba replied how long will it be before you are off we shall be moving in ten minutes at present there is not light enough to see the shore chafu are you awake yes chebron answered sleepily i am awake thanks to your talking if you had lain quiet we might have slept for another hour yet you have had plenty of sleep the last twenty-four hours amuba retorted take a cloth and let us land and run along the banks for a mile and have a bath before the boat comes along it is very cold for it chebron said nonsense the water will refresh you come along chefu jethro said your brother is right a dip will refresh us for the day the Egyptians were most particular about bathing and washing. The heat and dust of the climate rendered cleanliness an absolute necessity, and all classes took their daily bath. 
the wealthy in baths attached to their houses the poor in the water of the lakes or canals jethro and the two lads leaped ashore and ran briskly along the bank for about a mile stripped and took a plunge in the river and were dressed again just as the boat came along with the four men towing her and the captain steering with an oar at the stern it was light enough now for him to distinguish the faces of his passengers and he brought the boat straight alongside the bank in a few minutes the girls came out from their cabin looking fresh and rosy so you have been bathing misa said we heard what you were saying and we have had our bath too how did you manage that chebron asked we went out by the door at the other side of our cabin in our woolen robes on to that little platform on which the man is standing to steer and poured jars of water over each other and you both slept well yes indeed and without waking once till we heard amnis call you to get up you disturbed every one you see amnis chebron said and a very good thing too amuba laughed if we had not had our bath when we did we should not have got an opportunity all day now we all feel fresh and ready for something to eat misa put in what would you like mytis ruth asked i am a capital cook you know and i don't suppose the men will be preparing their breakfast for a long time yet i think that will be a very good plan mytis jethro said but we will divide the labor between us the two boys shall stir up the brands smouldering on the flat stone hearth forward i will clean and get ready some fish nite shall cook them while mytis shall under her directions make us some cakes and put them into the hot ashes to bake we shall have to shift for ourselves later on there is nothing like getting accustomed to it of course the men will cook the principal meals but we can prepare little meals between times it is astonishing how many times you can eat during the day when you are in the open air in half an hour the meal consisting of the fish light dough cakes which misa had with much amusement prepared under ruth's directions and fruit was ready the latter consisted of grapes and melons the meal was greatly enjoyed and by the time it was finished the sun was already some distance up the sky for an hour the party sat on the deck forward watching the boats coming down the stream and the villages on the opposite shore but as the sun gained power they were glad to enter into the cabin the mats were rolled up now to allow a free passage of air and as they sat on the cushions they could look out on both sides day after day passed quietly and smoothly the men generally towed the boat from sunrise until eleven o'clock in the day then they moored her to the bank prepared a meal and after eating it went ashore if there were trees that afforded a shade there or if not spread out some mats on poles over the boat and slept in their shade till three o'clock then they towed until sunset moored her for the night cooked their second meal talked and sang for an hour or two and then lay down for the night sometimes the wind blew with sufficient strength to enable the boat to stem the string close in shore by means of the sail alone then the boatmen were perfectly happy and spent their day in alternate eating and sleeping generally the passengers landed and walked alongside of the boat for an hour or two after they had had their early breakfast and again when the heat of the day was over it made a change and at the same time kept their muscles in a state of health and activity we may have to make long journeys on foot jethro said and the more we can accustom ourselves to walking the better the time passed so quietly and pleasantly that both misa and chebron at times blamed themselves for feeling as light-hearted as they did but when the latter once said so to jethro he replied do not be uneasy on that score remember that in the first place it is a comfort to us all that you and your sister are cheerful companions it makes the journey lighter for us in the next place good spirits and good health go together and although at present our life is an easy one there will be need for health and strength presently this flight and exile are at present blessings rather than misfortunes to you just as amuba's captivity following so closely upon the death of his father and mother was to him i can hardly believe misa said that we are really going upon a dangerous expedition everything is so pleasant and tranquil the days pass without any care or trouble i find it difficult to believe that the time is not very far off when we shall have to cross deserts and perhaps to meet savage beasts and wild people and be in danger of our lives 
it will be a long time first mytis it will be months before we arrive at mero the capital of the next kingdom which lies at the junction of the two great arms of this river up to that point i do not think there will be dangers though there may be some little difficulty for they say there are tremendous rapids to be passed it is only lately that the king overran mero defeated its armies and forced it to pay tribute but as there is a considerable trade carried on with that country i do not think there is any danger of molestation it is on leaving mero that our difficulties will commence for as i hear the road thence to the east through the city of axum which is the capital of the country named abyssinia passes through a wild land abounding with savage animals and again beyond axum the country is broken and difficult down to the sea chigron told me however that he had heard from a native of mero who had worked for him that there is a far shorter road to the sea from a point at which the river takes a great bend many hundreds of miles below the capital when we get higher up we can of course make inquiries as to this i hope that it may prove to be true for if so it will save us months of travel several large towns were passed as they journeyed upward hermonthis standing on the western bank by which they were travelling was the first past then came esne with grand temples dedicated to neph and naeth and standing where the nile valley opens to a width of five miles then they passed elithia standing on the eastern bank with many temples rising above it and with the sandstone rock behind it dotted with the entrances to sepulchres a few miles higher up they passed edfu above this the valley gradually narrowed the hills closing in until they rose almost perpendicularly from the edge of the stream here were temples erected especially for the worship of the nile and of his emblem the crocodile it appeared to the egyptians the most appropriate place for the worship of the river which seemed here to occupy the whole width of egypt here too were vast quarries from which the stone was extracted for the building of most of the temples of upper egypt sixteen miles higher ombi was passed with its great temple in honor of the crocodile-headed god sabak along this part of the river the country was comparatively barren and the villages small and far apart in the narrow places the river at times ran so rapidly that it was necessary to hire a number of peasants to assist the boatmen to drag the boat against the stream and the progress made each day was very slight four days after leaving ombi they arrived at syene by far the largest town they had come to since leaving thebes this brought the first stage of their journey to an end hitherto they had been travelling along a tranquil river running strongly at times but smooth and even before them they had a succession of cataracts and rapids to pass and a country to traverse which although often subjugated was continually rising against the power of egypt at syene they remained for three days they would gladly have pushed on without delay for although the egyptian authority extended further up the river syene was the last town where the governor would concern himself with the affairs of egypt or where fugitives from justice were likely to be arrested however as it was customary to give boatmen a few days of repose after their labor and before undertaking the still more severe work which lay before them jethro thought it better to avoid any appearance of haste there was much to be seen that was new to them at syene a great trade was carried on with mero most of the merchants engaged in it dwelt here buying on the one hand the products of upper and lower egypt and sending or taking them up the river and on the other hand buying the products of mero and dispatching them to thebes the streets were filled with a mingled population egyptians with their spotless garments and tranquil mien merchants absorbed in business officers and soldiers in large numbers for syene was an important military station officials belonging to the great quarries near and gangs of slaves of many nationalities working under their orders wild-looking figures moved among the crowd their garments thrown loosely round them affording a striking contrast to the cleanness of those of the egyptians while their unkempt hair was in equally strong contrast to the precise wigs of the middle-class egyptians and the bare heads of the lower class their skins too were much darker in color though there was a considerable variation in this respect among them were a sprinkling of men of entirely different type almost black in hue with thicker lips and flatter features these were ethiopians whose land lay beyond that of mero and who had also felt the weight and power of the arms of egypt 
these people of mero amuba said are very similar in features to the egyptians chebron and their tongue is also not unlike yours i can understand their speech our oldest books chebron said say that we are kindred people and are asiatic rather than african in our origin the people of Mero say that their far-back ancestors came from Arabia, and first spreading along the western shore of the Red Sea, ascended to the high lands and drove out the black people who inhabited them. As to our own origin, it is vague, but my father has told me that the opinion among those most skilled in the ancient learning is that we too came from Arabia. We were not all one people, that is certain, and it is comparatively of recent years, though a vast time as far as human lives go, that the people of the Thebaid, that is, of Upper Egypt, extended their dominion over Lower Egypt and made the whole country one nation. Even now, you know, the king wears two crowns, the one of Upper Egypt, the other of the Lower Country. Along the shores of the Great Sea to the west are Libyans and other peoples, similar in race to ourselves my father considered that the tribes which first came from asia pressed on to the west driving back or exterminating the black people each fresh wave that came from the east pushed the others further and further until at last the ancestors of the people of lower egypt arrived and settled there in mero the temples and religion are similar to our own whether they brought that religion from arabia or whether we planted it there during our various conquests of the country i cannot tell you but certain it is that there is at present but little more difference between upper egypt and mero than there is between upper egypt and the delta and beyond mero the people are all black like those we see here so i believe amuba our merchants penetrate vast distances to the south exchanging our products for gold and ivory and everywhere they find the country inhabited by black people living in wretched villages without as it seems any government or law or order waging war with each other and making slaves whom they also sell to our merchants they differ so wholly from us that it is certain that we cannot come from the same stock but they are strong and active and make excellent slaves lying between mero and the sea the country called abyssinia is also inhabited by a race of arab blood but differing more from us than those of mero they have great towns but i do not think that their religion is the same as ours our traders say that their language can be understood by them although more rough and unpolished i have heard my father say that he considered that all the country lying east of the nile and of its eastern branch that rises in abyssinia and is called the takazi belongs to asia rather than to africa the party found that the death by violence of two successive high priests of osiris was one of the principal topics of conversation in syene but none appeared to think that there was the remotest probability of any concerned in those occurrences making for the south however jethro thought it prudent that the whole party should not land together and therefore amuba and chebron usually went one way and he with the girls another they paid visits to the sacred island of ebo opposite the town and to the quarries of phile four miles away here they saw the gangs of slaves cutting colossal statues obelisks and shrines from the solid rock first the outline was traced on the rock then the surrounding stone was removed with chisels and wedges and at last the statue or obelisk was itself severed from the rock then it was hewn and sculptured by the masons placed on rollers and dragged by hundreds of men down to the landing-place below the rapids and these placed on rafts to be floated down the river to its destination they saw many of these masses of stone in all stages of manufacture the number of slaves employed was enormous and these inhabited great buildings erected near the quarries where also were barracks for the troops who kept guard over them watching the slaves at their painful labor jethro and amuba were both filled with gratitude at the good fortune that had placed them with ameres instead of sending them to pass their lives in such unceasing and monotonous toil among the slaves were several whom by their complexion and appearance they judged to be rebu as at first all those brought to egypt had been distributed among the priests and great officers they supposed that either from obstinacy misconduct or from attempts to escape they had incurred the displeasure of their masters and had been handed over by them for the service of the state had the slaves been in the hands of private masters jethro and amuba who were filled with pity at seeing their countrymen in such a state would have endeavored to purchase them and take them with them upon their journey 
this was out of the question now nor was it possible to hold any communication with them or to present them with a small sum of money to alleviate their misery without exciting suspicion the whole party were heartily glad when on the morning of the fourth day after their arrival the boat was pushed off from the shore and the work of ascending the rapids began End of chapter 16